Okay, again, just so everybody knows that I've changed assignments around a little bit because I hadn't anticipated that we have a faculty research day on Tuesday and we won't be here. Okay, so I don't want to give you a bunch of assignments for us some kind of introduction. Okay, good. Now, uh, everybody that did it, and I think it's about everybody did it, did pretty well, to very well on the assignment on graphing polynomials. Uh, just to kind of review that, um, in terms of an example we did in the MDE 61 class, we have this polynomial, okay? And we want to plot the x and y intercepts and sketch the graph. Now, I recommend when you do these, and if you're in the other class, of course, you're hearing it again, and you probably need to hear it the first time, but here we go. Um, I recommend that we write things out like this so you remember what you're doing instead of just doing it by habit and getting the answers and getting the credit and going on. If you take 10% more time on the assignment and write things out, you're going to remember it much better. Okay. Um, and you're going to need to remember it uh, because the other thing I wanted to tell you is you're going to have to have a midterm exam toward the end of the month and it's already getting toward the middle. Okay. So that's like in two weeks. Okay. So by then, we will have covered quadratic functions and a little bit more about polynomials. We won't quite be into rational functions, and you can be thankful for that, because that one's the algebra there is probably the, the most challenging algebra in the course. Okay. After that, the algebra gets a lot easier. So you have something to look forward to. But um, so the rational functions will probably not be on the midterm exam. If we've already talked about rational functions, where some of you have done it, problems so you can show off. Optional problems are problems that get counted if you get them, you know, if they help your brain and they just get tossed out if they don't. Okay. Um, okay, so anyhow, back to here. Graph this function. I'll write all this on X intercept, right out Y equals zero, so you know that the x-intercept occurs from y equals zero, and you think about why that's so, because that's something that people are not really in the habit of knowing at this point in the course. Maybe more since last time, since I kind of emphasized it. Okay? That's a very important thing. It's got to be second nature. Anything you graph, you look for the intercepts, and the x-intercept occurs from y equals zero. Why? Because the y-coordinate of any point in the x-axis is zero. It goes through the line y equals zero. Okay? And similarly, uh, the y-intercept occurs when x equals zero, because that, that's the coordinate. Zero is the x-coordinate of any point on the y-axis. Okay, so x-intercept y equals zero. So we take this function and we set y equal to zero. We'll leave the p of x off right now. We don't need it. And there we have it. Okay, now this splits into three equations. x minus 5 equals zero plus six equals three. You can tell by just looking at it what the zeros are going to be because I don't even have any coefficients on the x. But in general, you're going to have to write out the equation and solve it. Okay. Uh, so you want to get in the habit of writing the three equations with the or in between, which helps you with the logic. We talked about that. With this in, in relation to inequalities, but it, the, the logic is important in any problem. Okay, you'll understand it better if you understand the logic. Okay, so we get x equals five or x equals negative four or x equals negative six. So we can have this point or this point or this point on the graph. Those are our x intercepts. I listed them down here. I don't need to bring it to you. Okay. Then you get the y intercept. Well, that occurs when x equals zero. So all you do is plug in x equals zero and you get y. And now you have the point. If you plug in x equals zero, it's easy to see you get negative 120. So right there's your y-intercept at negative 120. And then you sketch the graph. Why does the graph go up over here and down over here? Well, it's because when you expand this, when you multiply all this out, you end up with an x cubed as the highest power term. And the x cubed dominates the heck out of x squared and x. If X bits big enough, no matter how big the coefficient of X squared, if X gets bigger than that coefficient, then X cubed is going to be bigger than X squared. And if X is a lot bigger than the coefficient of X squared, 
X cubed is a lot bigger. So if X gets as big as you like, X cubed can be as dominant over X squared and the lower power terms as you might wish. Okay, so we say that over here, the graph becomes like the graph of X cubed. And over here, it becomes like the graph of X cubed on the negative. What's the graph of X cubed look like? Well, you know, it's one of your fundamental functions. It's like this. It's very steep over here. It's very steep over here. This function has to do the same. It is concave up everywhere. So it doesn't go up and then kind of tail off. People get careless toward that. I even do it sometimes, okay? You, you, you're tired of going up so fast, you think I kind of get a little lazy. Uh, and now uh, your graph has a flaw that, that I might even ding you a point for, okay? If it's an important flaw, maybe three points. Usually not that important. I just you can mostly complain about it a little bit, okay? Try to keep you straight on that. It's just important to understand those behaviors. All right. Um, now, we plotted y equals p of x plus 10. How does y equals p of x plus 10 relate to y equals p of x? Well, the values of p of x plus 10, the y values are 10 units greater. Because you're saying, take whatever p of x is and add 10. Okay, what's that do to the graph? Well, we'll see in a minute. It vertically shifts at 10 units. That's what it does. Okay. An example, if x equals negative 6, p of x is 0. Let's go back to this p of x function. There's your x plus 6. x is negative 6. whole thing is 0. So what is p of x plus 10 going to equal? Well, if x equals 0, p of x is p of 0, which is 0, right? So you have p of 0, which is 0, plus 10. 0 plus 10, you get 10. So instead of the point negative 6, 0 on the graph, you get the point negative 6, 10. Instead of the point negative 4, 0, you get the point negative 4, 10. Instead of the point 5, 0, you get the point 5, 10. Okay. So now the P of X plus 10 graph is 10 units higher than the P of X graph. P of X is P of X plus 10 is P of X vertically shifted 10 units, and that just reinforces all the ideas behind vertical shifts. In the FDE 61 class, we might want to look at that. If we expand this thing, we get this. And we expand it just by multiplying the last two binomials to get this. And then we multiply by this and use the distributive law and very quickly we get this function. Okay. Notice it has an x cubed out in front. Why does it have an x cubed? Well, when you multiply these two, you get an x squared. Then when you multiply this thing by x, as you have to do, you're going to get an x cubed. So you've got an x cubed. Okay. What I'm trying to establish here is that when x is a whole lot bigger than any of the zeros, you get far away from your zeros. This function is not much different than x cubed itself. And we do some calculations. We calculate p of 100. Well, that's 100 cubed plus 5 times 100 squared. And it's using this. So we get some numbers. And what we can see with these numbers is our first two numbers are a million and 50,000. If I add those, the million is here, the 50,000 is here. The difference between a million and a million plus 50,000 is out here in the third figure, okay? It's only about a 5% difference. So that when X is equal to 100, P of X is equal to just X cubed within about 5%. And if we use 1,000 here, it would be about 0.05%. Okay. Um, and then what we get is a graph Okay, this white graph is the x cubed graph and this blue graph is our p of x graph. Now the scale here is from negative 100 to 100. The big difference between these two graphs 
occurs if we zoom in close to the origin where we've got this. If we get away from the origin, the graph is very close to the graph of just X cubed. Bottom line is the graph becomes like the graph of X cubed here, becomes like the graph of X cubed here. Not in here, but as you get out of ways, it becomes just like X cubed. So it's got to go down here and up there because that's what X cubed does. Now, if we graph a very similar function, Lost my function. Okay, well, this is the same function except I squared this. What does that do to the graph? Well, one thing it does is your y intercept becomes positive instead of negative because when x is zero, x minus five is negative. If it isn't squared, you got a negative uh, times two positives gives you a negative. Okay. If you square it, you've got an extra negative. And of course, you square the negative, it's going to be positive. So it flips your y-intercept from negative 120 up to the other side of the x. It's actually to 600 because 0 minus 5 is minus 5. Minus 5 times negative 120 is 600. So you get 600. Now, this graph is on a different scale than that graph for scale. Here, 120 was that big. Here, 600 is this big. OK? Still have the same zeros though. Near this zero, as you know, if you've done the homework, you got to do it like this, okay? You got to touch it, you're not going to go through it. Why is that? Well, let's go back to the equation you saw to find the zeros. I say you should be writing out this equation, okay? This is equal to zero. Yeah, this is equal to zero. So that'd be x minus five squared equals zero. Or if x plus four is zero. Or if x equals negative six. Now, if x equals negative six, x plus six is zero. If x equals negative four, x plus four is zero. If x equals five, this is zero twice. Why is it zero twice? Well, it's pretty easy to see that. What does x minus five squared mean? It means x minus five times x minus five. So the equation x minus five squared equals zero means x minus five times x minus five equals zero, which means that x minus five equals zero or x minus five equals zero. Okay, in the same sense, we have these statements up here twice. If it equals zero twice at a point, it almost looks like a negative five, but it is. Then you're going to have parabolic behavior here. Why is it parabolic behavior here? Well, it's because when x is close to five, x plus four is close to what? Nine, right? X is close to five. You add four to something that's close to five, it's going to be close to nine. If you add four, something close to six, it's going to be close to 10. So this is close to nine, this is close to 10. Nine times 10 is 90. So this is close to 90 times x minus five squared. Can you graph 90 times x minus five squared? Yeah, you take it four by four squared, and you make it a 360 by four squared, because you got to stretch it 90 times, okay? So it's going to be 90 times as big, 90 times as high. Now, even 90 on this scale is only about that much. 360 on this scale will be about this much. Okay, so your square would go to like this, and your graph would look like this, which is a lot like this one looks. Okay, and this isn't a particularly well graph. It's not. It's a little too sharp here, but so be it. Um, so what happens near this point is that you have something, at least within a small region around here, that's just a parabola. 
so it doesn't go through the x-axis. It's just the 90 times x minus 5 squared graph shifted 5 units to the right. So then a small region This graph is close to 90 times the square of x minus 5. They could actually draw boxes on this graph, and I, I could do that, but I'm not going to go that far. Be interesting about all the things we have to do. So, why does this graph go up here and up here? Okay, well, we've established why it acts like this here. Over here, it acts like some multiple of x minus 4 x plus 4. Over here, it acts like some multiple of x plus 6. Okay? Those are both linear. So it goes through and it goes through. Why does it go up at both ends? It's because if you expand this, you're going to get an x to the fourth. And you're going to get an x squared out of this. If you square this, you're going to get an x squared. So the x squared is going to multiply this x squared, and you're going to get an x to the fourth. Then you're going to get some x cubed and some x squareds and some x's and some this plain old number, the plain old number will be 600. <laughs> so the graph is going to look like an x to the fourth graph. X to the fourth looks a whole lot like x squared, except it's kind of flatter here and steeper here. So it might be a reasonably decent approximation of an x to the fourth graph. And of course, it's on a much bigger scale. You got negative 100 here, 100 here, okay? Which means you have like 100 million for your y coordinates out here, okay? The graph is gonna stay very close to this one, just like the graph of the previous function stayed close to the x cubed graph, except in toward the middle where it can wiggle a little bit, because there are the wiggles, okay? So it's gonna do this here in the middle. Now the middle is actually gonna be quite a bit smaller than that, but I had to draw something to see. And it's probably a little hard to see that. You see this little white section here? That's a little bit of Um Okay. If you understand all that, and you know, that's probably 10 or 12 minutes on the video. Uh, if you understand this stuff pretty well, uh, go through that and try to understand everything I just said. Okay. If you got time, because you'll understand it better and you're going to be likely to perform better in the exam. Probably be some you know, optional problems that ask you questions and that. Get everything else prepared first where you're pretty confident that you're going to get everything. And if you have time to do that, you can be some extra credit problems of that nature. We'll see. Uh, that gives you a deep understanding of what you just did for a while. And having just done it, hopefully you like to sum what I just said. Okay, well, we need to move on to quadratic functions, which is something you ought to be real well prepared to do uh, because we've been dealing with them. Matter of fact, you tend to use quadratic functions where you're supposed to use exponential and reciprocal functions. So a lot of that, I'm homework and a lot of that even on the, on the uh, test. Uh, of course, I didn't hurt you too bad because I didn't have that many problems of that nature. Okay, what's a quadratic function? Quadratic function would be y equals a f of x minus h quantity squared plus k, where y is your toolkit squared function. You learn how to construct these functions early in the course. I use y equals g of x. g of x is your quadratic function. f of x is your toolkit scoring function. Well, your toolkit scoring function has a vertex. So any quadratic function. As a vertex, I'm going to 
represent the vertex of jingle by a red dot to remind you of the toolkit square function. Then I'm going to draw a graph. I should have drawn the graph and then run by red dots to make it sloppy. I find it really difficult to draw a circle through three given points or to draw a parabola where you actually have the vertex. So there's the vertex. Okay, maybe not too bad of a parabola. And one other note, I want to draw an active parabola. I just draw a box as big as I like and follow the same rules that I use to do the toolkit parabola. That works for power functions. It doesn't for exponential functions, for example. Or logarithmic functions or square roots. Kind of works for square roots. Okay, so here we have it. We have graph. We have an axis of symmetry. We have a y intercept. And we have zero. Or x intercepts. Where the graph crosses the x axis. Now, the graph doesn't always cross the x-axis, but if it crosses the x-axis, the zeros will be at equal distances from the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry is halfway between the zeros. So, can you tell me, in terms of symbols I have on the board, what the coordinates of the vertex are? Okay, now what we did with the squared function to create a function of a different quadratic is we first vertically stretched it and maybe reflected it across the x-axis. As happened here, because this thing's opening downward, not upward, that means that uh, there's a coefficient in front of x squared that's negative. And that's it. You know, you look at the coefficient of x squared, that tells you how far to shift it. I stretch it, and it tells you whether to reflect it. Those two things. So that isn't real clear to you. First of all, think about how you've done some of the assignments. It's easy to do an assignment and get the right answer without everything sinking in, which is why I keep emphasizing write out what you're doing. If you write it out, you're going to remember it much better than if not. And I think I'm seeing a lot of stuff that you've done kind of in your head and by imitating videos. Uh, and I'm talking about the fact that some people uh, appear to have done just every possible thing. Okay. And some people have gotten by. Uh, but you're in shape to get by much better. So please, please follow up. Okay. So take my advice. Write things out. Draw pictures. Don't just typed in the right answer because you did what the video said without really thinking about it, okay? Or whatever. Um, and of course, the problems I get you this weekend are going to try to draw out some of that stuff and, and, and just try to hone you a little bit better, okay? So you'll succeed uh, hopefully very nicely in the midterm a couple of weeks. All right. So, Again, back to what we did with the tool, any toolkit function. We construct it and we move the red dot. I say, how do you move the red dot? You move it over and you move it up. What I use for this in symbols for how you move it over and how you move it up, I use H and K, right there it is. So my question is, what, is the coordinate of the, what are the coordinates of this vertex in terms of symbols on the board? This, this vertex is at.
Okay. All right. And the zeros, we know we get those by the quadratic formula, right? Yeah, and of course, uh, sometimes you get them by factoring, but in the real world, that never works. Okay. Uh, the zeros. the quadratic formula. And of course, the quadratic formula can end up with a negative under the radical. And if it does, that means the graph is either wholly above or wholly below the x-axis and doesn't pass through the x-axis. It always passes through the y-axis. You get the y-intercept by letting x equal zero, right? Zeros occur when y equals zero. Those are your x intercepts, and you find it by the quadratic formula. You might not be able to read all that if you're sitting close to the back. Because just slip through the video, you'll find this, and it should be nice and clear. Because I verify right now that the board is in good focus. Either that or my eyes are out of focus in a way that totally compensates for the way the board's out of focus. I don't think that's it. Um, how do you get the y-intercept? It occurs when x equals zero. Okay. And the function Is y equals g of x equals a f of x minus h, not square. People want to put the square in there. They must be catching that. Y equals a f plus k. The square is in the definition of f of x. It doesn't go there. Okay. And what's this say? This is the general for any function. This function g of x is the same as the f of x function, except the f of x function is vertically stretched by factor A, reflected a phase and that's less than zero. That's what A tells you. You stretch it out and make it flip it. Horizontally shifted H units, vertically shifted K units. You gotta lock that in. You need to understand functional notation well enough to understand how that applies, not just to the squared function, but to the exponential function, to this reciprocal function, to the reciprocal square, to the reciprocal, uh, to, to the cubing function, okay? Or to an absolute value function, or to a square root function. Then fairly soon, and you probably actually like when we get to it, to logarithmic functions, okay? Okay, now, what is a f of x minus h plus k? If f of x equals x squared, I'm going to pause a minute. I'm going to ask you to write that out. Okay. So here's the question. I'll write it down over here. And you might not be able to see it on the video. If f of x equals x squared, Right. U of x equals a f of x minus h plus k. Let's write that out in symbols. Okay, uh, people are having trouble with this. Okay, more trouble than I would have anticipated. But if there's trouble, we're going to try to fix it. So I'm pull this over. And the problem is, 
simply that you need to focus on what I told you about function notation. It's just a matter of substitution. So, Here's your definition of f of x. What's f of x minus h? Can you write it down? When I write it one thing below the other, that might jog your memory. So let, let me just give you 30 seconds to see if you can write that down. OK. I'm not going to ask you to count how many times I've done this in sentence, OK? But in this video, you know where to look for it. I don't know how long we've been going on. I've been raving on for you know, probably 20, 25 minutes into the video. Maybe not that many, maybe 15 minutes. Okay, f of x equals x squared. If you want to do f of r bar, what are you going to get? You're going to get r bar squared, right? Because x is now r bar. Well, here, x is not r bar. x has been replaced by x minus h. So I replace this x by x minus h. When I replace this x by x minus h, I get square of x minus h. Okay? There's no f over here because there's no f here. So make sure you understand. And just to make sure, and digress a little more. Do these. 2 to the x, 1 over x, square root of x. Same thing. Okay, now the, the common thing I saw is people write this up, and then over next to it, they'll write their f of x minus h, but they won't even write f of x minus h equals. Okay? So what, when I say do this, uh, unless you're really never making mistakes with function notation, write it out like this. Write your definition here, and underneath, write your f of r mark or whatever equals, so that you see that x has been replaced by f. x So you'll then do the x is to the x minus h because x has been replaced by x minus h. Okay. Here. If you replace x by x minus h, then you replace this x by x minus h and you get one over x minus h. This one, if you replace x by x minus h, you got to